Most people think trains should be perfectly balanced when they take a curve. They're wrong, and engineers do it on purpose. With high-speed trains, slow freight, and one shared track, you simply can't design the perfect curve for every train. In this video, I'll show you how Cant Deficiency lets us bend the rules, literally, to keep traffic flowing safely and efficiently. From mixed traffic railways to tilting trains, Cant Deficiency is a key design variable used across modern railway networks. If you look up the definition of deficiency, it is a lack or shortage of something. Cant deficiency means the applied cant is less than the equilibrium cant for the curve and speed in question. In simple terms, it's the difference, measured in millimetres, between how much cant curves should have to balance the forces and how much there actually is. Let's define a few key terms here. Cant is the height difference between the two rails. It helps balance the lateral forces experienced in a curve. Equilibrium cant is the amount that would perfectly balance gravity and centrifugal force, making the resultant force act directly into the track. More on this in a minute. If you've ever taken a corner quickly in a car and felt pushed to the outside, that's the same lateral force that cant is designed to counter. To understand why engineers would intentionally run trains below equilibrium cant, we need to look at the physics. Here we have a train on a track. On straight, level track, the train's weight is shared equally between the two rails. But once it enters the curve, it begins to accelerate laterally as it changes direction. This change produces a force pushing the train outwards. The faster the train goes, the greater that lateral force becomes. This combines with gravity to produce a resultant force that leans outward from the track. If that resultant force tilts too far to the outside of the track, it affects the ride comfort and stability. And that's why we apply cant, by raising the outer rail to help rebalance these forces. For a curve, when looking at one specific speed, one value of cant perfectly balances the forces. This means the resultant is directly into the track. This is the equilibrium cant that we spoke about earlier, and it's calculated with this equation. But here's the issue. That calculation is only valid for that single speed. Trains don't all travel at the same speed, so one equilibrium cant value can't serve every train. If a train moves faster than that design speed, the cant is no longer sufficient. That's cant deficiency. But if it's slower and there is too much cant, this is known as cant excess. Now we understand what is happening to the forces on the train, let's look at how this affects how the train behaves. The direction of the resultant force determines which rail carries more load. So, at equilibrium cant, or flat straight track, both rails take equal loading. When a train operates with cant deficiency, more of that resultant force shifts towards the high rail on the outside of the curve. This increases the force and possibly wear on that rail. On the other hand, if there's a cant excess, too much cant for the speed, the force shifts towards the low rail. These imbalances affect stability, rail wear, and how the bogey steers through the curve. We'll touch on the benefits and drawbacks of this in a minute. If you're learning this stuff and want to really make it stick, I've put together a free guide that breaks down cant and cant deficiency in really simple terms. It's full of diagrams and real world examples, exactly the kind of thing I wish I had when I was first starting out. You can download it from the link in the description or in the top right hand corner now. It's totally free. Equilibrium cant, as we've seen, only works perfectly at one specific speed. But in reality, trains almost never take a curve at that exact speed, especially on busy mixed traffic railways. In the UK, for example, passenger and freight trains often share the same lines. These trains differ not only in speed limits, but on also how fast they can practically operate. Passenger trains usually have a higher speed limit, but factors like station stops, signal spacing, and nearby junctions can all impact on the speed they're actually traveling. Freight trains, on the other hand, are heavier, slower to accelerate, and often restricted to lower limits of speed. So how do you design a curve that works for all of them? This is where camp deficiency comes in. By applying less than the full equilibrium can, designers create a compromise that allows faster trains to pass through curves safely without creating excess can for the slower ones. And it isn't just about mixed traffic. Even on passenger only lines, applying some camp deficiency brings other benefits, which we're gonna look at now. So, Using cant deficiency to push that resultant force towards the high outer rail has some benefits. Cant deficiency improves how the train steers through a curve. It helps reduce hunting, the side-to-side -side movement between rails that can occur, and smooths out the passenger's ride. At the wheel-rail interface, cant deficiency reduces the angle of attack of the wheel, which lowers wear. 
A smaller angle of attack means less flange contact and a reduced surface stresses, which helps prolong both wheel and rail life. It also reduces both rail wear and the propagation of rolling contact fatigue. And finally, as we've said, it lets trains of different types use the same curve at different speeds without major compromises. But as with anything, for all the benefits, there are some drawbacks. Increased cant deficiency raises the forces on that high rail. The greater the deficiency, the more that rail is stressed, leading to higher wear, more frequent maintenance, and an increased risk of rail defects. It can also cause unloading of the wheels on the low rail. This is when the inner wheel lifts just enough to reduce the contact with the rail. This can reduce the contact stability, especially in the presence of poor track geometry, like twist faults, dip joints, or worn crossings. In extreme conditions, such as very hot weather, high cant deficiency can also exacerbate the risk of track buckling by increasing the longitudinal and lateral forces applied to the high rail. Vehicle dynamics also come into play. At high cant deficiency levels, the train suspension may reach its limits. This reduces the margin of safety down for both ride quality and those track geometry defects. And if the applied cant is poorly chosen, both fast and slow trains suffer. A curve designed with too much cant for those slow trains creates that cant excess, causing the low rail to take more load than it should do. Conversely, if there's too little cant for those higher speed trains, it ends up running at too high a cant efficiency, increasing the lateral forces on both the track and the passengers. This tension makes it crucial to strike a balance that optimises the real-world operational speeds, not just what's theoretically possible or is the signs posted speed. In areas with large speed differentials, this becomes a design challenge that does demand careful modelling, the experience of the designer and sometimes a compromise has to be made. So what do the standards say when it comes to cant deficiency? In the UK, cant deficiency is typically limited to 110 millimetres, with up to 150 millimetres allowed in specific situations. France and Germany allow similar maximums. These limits depend on factors like rolling stock type, suspension design and, most importantly, the track construction type. Stronger infrastructure can support higher cant deficiency levels. I promised earlier in this video we'd look at how a track designer decides how much cant deficiency to apply to a curve. So, how is it done? Well, here's the thing. There isn't one set formula. Not anymore. It used to be taught that you apply about two-thirds of the equilibrium cant, leaving one-third as cant deficiency. That simple rule of thumb works reasonably well. But modern analysis tools have shown how powerful cant deficiency really is. Now, engineers might apply even more cant deficiency, depending on the context. So, what factors does a designer need to consider? First, it comes down to train types and how many of each are running. Is it mostly freight? Is it mostly passenger? A mixture. The more freight you have, the lower the speed, and that influences how much cant you can safely apply. Next, you look at speed. But it's not just the maximum line speed you're interested in, it's the actual speed trains are likely to travel at. There's no point in designing for 100 miles an hour if most trains are doing 60 because of signals, station stops, and gradients. The design needs to be safe for 100 miles an hour, but can be optimised for 60. Then comes the surrounding features. Are there platforms nearby? A junction? Turnout? A signal that causes frequent stopping? These can all limit how fast a train enters or exits the curve, and that affects the optimal cant value. You also need to think about the infrastructure itself. Is this a new track layout or an upgrade to an existing railway? Can the track bed and the ballast handle the increased lateral loads from higher cant deficiency? If not, your options may be limited. All these considerations feed into your decision. It's a balance between what's theoretically ideal and what's operationally practical. Tools like TrackX and other simulation software help a lot, but ultimately, experience and engineering judgement carry a lot of weight. And it's not just about numbers, it's understanding how the railway behaves day to day. So far, we've treated trains as passive, just responding to the forces acting on them. But what if the train itself could help? That's exactly what tilting trains are designed to do. A tilting train leans its car body into the curve, either passively through suspension geometry or actively using sensors and hydraulic or electric systems. The key benefit? It reduces the lateral acceleration felt by passengers. This means you can run at a higher cant deficiency values, getting through those curves faster without sacrificing passenger comfort. But here's an important point. Tilt doesn't change the actual forces between the wheel and the rail. The track sees the same loading. What changes is how those forces are felt inside the carriage. 
This is why tilt technology is often paired with high CAN deficiency values in fast inner city routes that also need to share infrastructure with slower trains. There's a lot more to say on tilting trains, like tilt speed thresholds, clearance envelope issues and motion sickness. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a full video on how tilt systems and tilting trains really work. The use of CAN deficiency has come a long way, from the simple one-third rule of thumb for mixed traffic to a deliberate and refined design strategy. Today, it helps engineers optimise performance, reduce rail wear and improve passenger comfort, all by making the most of what the track and train can handle. Remember, if you want to dig deeper into CAN and how it actually works in track design, I've made a free guide just for this. It's clear, practical and full of the kind of examples that will help you apply it in the real world. Grab it at the link below.